here as we gather together uh, toward the end of the season of Advent, a glorious season in the life of the church. We hope you'll sign the friendship sheets as, the, as the pads are passed back and forth so we can have a record of your attendance, but also so you can uh, make connection, put names and faces together of the people that you are worshiping alongside today. Uh, it's a great help to us, and so we, we do hope that you'll uh, send those uh, pads back and forth along the pew. Glad to have Kathy Johnson here to offer her uh, uh, wonderful voice uh, to our experience of worship today. It's always a treat to have her home, and uh, when she's home, we put her to work. And if you haven't heard her sing, you'll understand why in a few minutes. Also, uh, we're grateful that Anna Grace Thompson is going to uh, play our wonderful piano again today, and so it's always a, that's always a treat as well. So. But we're also grateful for all the, the choir and choral music that we enjoy during this season. And the, the room is still reverberating from last Sunday's service. On the back of the bulletin, you see various announcements, uh, things going on in the life of the church. I, I don't want to belabor many of those except to remind you that uh, tomorrow is Christmas Eve. If this has come as a shock to you, um, I'm, I'm glad to uh, give you a little notice about it. Uh, so if you're not uh, ready for some of the things about Christmas, uh, tomorrow is Christmas Eve. From our perspective, what that means is we have three opportunities for worship. Uh, five o'clock service will be a service primarily designed for children and their families. It's a fairly brief service, fairly informal. Lots of singing and uh, a simple retelling of the Christmas story. That's at five o'clock. There'll be a, a reception following that. Then at 7 o'clock, we will have a service of lessons and carols where we'll get a chance to sing together many of the wonderful uh, carols of the season and also hear the story of Jesus from uh, the prophecy of his birth to the fulfillment of his birth to theological reflection about the significance of that birth. And so that's the service of lessons and carols at 7 o'clock. And then at 11 o'clock tomorrow evening, uh, a service of communion where we will, uh, if, if we time it just right, we will be finishing up our service about the time to welcome Christmas morning uh, when we will be able to greet one another uh, as Christmas Day uh, begins. So three opportunities for worship, very different opportunities. Oftentimes people come to one or two. Uh, you'd be welcome to come to all three. Uh, and we'd uh, uh, be glad to have you here uh, to help deepen and enrich your experience of this Christmas season. Just a couple of other things. Uh, please remember our FPC Shares program. Uh, the food pantries uh, need our help, and we're one of the uh, biggest suppliers uh, to stock the shelves of the food pantries we support. This month, we're trying to collect as, as much, as many cans of soup as we can. Um, uh, particularly now that the weather has turned a little colder, soup is a wonderful thing to provide for families uh, who need good uh, nourishment. As we move into January, we change our item. We'll be collecting canned fruit. And so uh, if you do sh uh, shopping between, we've got one more Sunday in December, so we encourage you to bring soup. But uh, 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 as we begin into January, we'll be collecting as much canned fruit as we can, again, to stock the shelves of the three pantries that we support. But again, we're glad you're here as we worship God together. It's a glorious season of the year, a glorious time to be together as a church family. I invite you to use the time of the prelude to continue preparing yourself for this time of sacred worship.
please join me in the responsive reading as we light the fourth Advent candle. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light of the darkness has come. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Hear the word of the prophet Micah. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, you are the one of the little clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. Today, as we light the fourth candle of Advent, we remember that Christ is the good shepherd who has come to lead his people and care for his flock.
Please be seated. A voice is crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Let us make our confession to God, praying together the confession printed in the bulletin. We live with a certain tension, O oh God, for we want to be your faithful disciples. We want to honor you with our lives, but we aren't sure we are ready to make dramatic changes in what we value, in what we cherish, and in how we go about living of our actual lives. We have built a life around tending to our comforts, our wants, and our own personal happiness. And we know that Jesus calls us to a life of seeking first your kingdom and of paying special attention to our neighbors in need. We were hoping that discipleship could be about being just a little more Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Your sins are pardoned. The penalty is paid. Thanks be to God. Friends in Christ, in response to this gift of God's grace, how shall we live? With gratitude, following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. This is the way of Jesus, in whom we find life.
Well, that's one of our celebrations today. I think that we had the wonderful music last week augmented by professional musicians, and it didn't let up. Today we have our professional opera singer from Boston and Anna Grace Thompson, who, to paraphrase uh, Jason Baker, said it's a recent talent. So she's in the eighth grade, and she's been playing for 28 years. <laughs> Among our uh, pastoral concerns this morning, um, Ed McLeod had to spend some time at Duke Hospital this week to be with his aunt in her final hours. Uh, Cornelia Connie McLeod died Monday at the age of 88 at Duke Hospital. Um, at Duke Raleigh, Tom Grant was hospitalized with pneumonia. He has gone home. Uh, Dr. Nat Sparrow went home on Wednesday to continue healing from his bout with pneumonia. And I just found out this morning that uh, Dan Glasgow He's the one that took that fisheye picture that's on our website, uh, the Facebook page from our, our very first, our dedication day in here. He had knee surgery this week, and his wife Catherine says this may put an end to his soccer career, but uh, he's at home uh, watching football, uh, American football. Uh, other people, keeping your prayers, David Baxter, uh, Dick Wilson, Barbara Weir-Williams, who's at home some and is here today some, where she's very much at home. Let us come to God now in a time of prayer. Creator God, as we turn our attention to the giving of gifts, we're reminded vividly of your many, many gifts to us. The sanctuary itself, more beautiful than ever and acoustically marvelous, it's a gift that lifts our spirits and is drawing new people here. On Wednesday night, the presence of your Holy Spirit was palpable as our new officers told us their personal faith journeys and how enthused they are to help our church get even better in the next three years. Lord, you've blessed everyone here in amazing ways. And those you call to new challenges are eager to say, as did Mary, yes, here I am, a servant of the Lord. And so we wind down this Advent season having begun our new church year, freshly reminded of your saving gift of the Christ child long ago. And we sing with the carolers, abide with us, Emmanuel. Be born in us today. Loving God, we pray our prayers of intercession for those families in Connecticut and, alas, in almost every town who have lost young ones in untimely deaths. We pray for parents and families striving to survive unfathomable losses. And we pray for those we know who wonder if this will be their last Christmas on this earth. We pray your healing presence with those healing in mind, body, and soul. And we pray that you would enlighten world leaders to make decisions that lead to peace, justice, and special care for the downtrodden. As those lowly shepherds were privileged to hear and see the most amazing event that ever happened, may the lowly people today hear a word of hope and be touched by caring human hands. And in the words of that beloved Carol, may you impart to human hearts the blessings of your heaven. We pray with grateful and hopeful hearts the words Christ taught his followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
fair, right? So all of Advent, this time we've had before Christmas, where we light the Advent candle, right, is a time when we're preparing, where we're waiting. But Advent means coming or arrival. So we're waiting for Christ to come again. Now, we know that on Christmas, Jesus is born, and we remember that, and we celebrate that. But what we wait for and we are excited about is not, not just kind of sit around and wait for, but we're actively excited waiting for, is Jesus to come again. And one day, Jesus will come again. So not only are we waiting to see what Santa brought us, because let's be honest, we are excited to see if Santa brought us the new Barbie or the Skylander Giants or whatever it is. Those are cheap. So we are honestly waiting for that too. But we are waiting to see Christ again and to celebrate all that Christ is on Christmas morning. So I hope that you will, with your families, remember all that Christ is and celebrate Jesus this Christmas. Sometimes people say keep Christ in Christmas because Christ is part of Christmas. As somebody once said to me, oh, I bet that has to do with Jesus because Christ is in Christmas. I said, yes, very good. So let's pray together. Dear God, help us to celebrate you and remember Jesus on Christmas and that he came for us and that he loves us just as we are. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You can go back to your seats or you can go down here for some reason. Let us pray. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Lead us to your truth and teach us. For you are the God of our salvation. For you we wait all day long. Amen. Hear now the word of the Lord from Isaiah 12, verses 1 through 6. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. Surely, God is your salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say on that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted, sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth, Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the holy word of Israel. The word of God. turn now to Luke's record of the gospel, the third chapter, beginning our reading at the seventh verse. Listen again to God's word for us.
John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply he said, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, John proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. Lord God of grace, give us an openness to your word of truth and a devotion to your word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Be present with us by the power of your spirit that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Imagine you are at your local auto repair shop to get what you think is a routine state inspection and a safety check. It's an annual nuisance. But there's no one in line ahead of you, so you think it'll be quick. And so you pass the time reading outdated car and driver magazines. Eventually, the mechanic who's been looking over your car comes through the door into the room where you've been waiting, and he says, good news. You need new tires, new brakes, new belts, new hoses, and a new fuel pump. Good news. Or imagine you're at your doctor's office for your annual physical. You've had a bunch of tests, all of which you've had before, plus a few new ones, but you figure, well, I'm getting older, there'll be more tests. The doctor has come in and said, you can get dressed and I'll be back to speak with you in a few minutes. And in a few minutes, he comes back into the room and he says, good news. You've got severe blockages in your heart. We need to take you straight to the hospital for surgery. Good news. Or imagine that you're on your way out of class and your chemistry professor grabs you by the arm and asks you to stay after class, and so you do. And so the rest of the class is filed out and she closes the door, turns to you and says, Good news. You're failing chemistry. Good news. Or imagine being awakened in the middle of the night by the ringing of the telephone and being snapped to attention by the gruff voice of a police sergeant who says, Good news, your child has been arrested for driving under the influence. Good news. Now I ask you, how can any of those things even remotely be considered good news? 
a major car repair, an ominous medical diagnosis, impending academic failure, and a child in custody. How could any of those things even be remotely considered good news? Well, consider for a moment that the car inspection took, a week, took place a week before you and your family were scheduled for a cross-country trip. You had no idea your tires were in such poor shape or your brakes were shot to the point of being dangerous or the belts on your car were severely frayed or that several of the hoses were showing signs of wear or that the fuel pump was already leaking. Would you rather find this out in your neighborhood garage or somewhere in the middle of an Arizona desert? Not only a long way from home, but a long way from everywhere. Maybe hearing it from your trusted mechanic made it good news after all. Or consider for a moment that the doctor discovered the problem with your heart before your heart caused you a problem. Consider that the doctor discovered a problem in your heart before it caused a heart attack, a deterioration of your heart muscle, or worse. Or what about the news that you're failing chemistry? That can't be good. But what if the announcement comes right after the midterm so that you still have a lab report and a final exam to rescue your grade point average? Or what about the late night call though? Hearing the good news of your child's arrest for driving while intoxicated how can that be considered good news? Well, consider that the call came from the police and not the hospital. That the call came telling you that your child had been arrested. Not that your child had done irreparable harm to himself or someone else. Maybe it's good news that this unfortunate incident will finally bring to light your child's drinking problem while something can be done about it. As hard as it is to believe while you sit there in the dark that this is good news in the long run, maybe that late night phone call brought good news after all. At first glance, none of these things, the car repair, the heart diagnosis, the failing of class, and on and none of these things sound like good news, but perhaps they are. Perhaps each one of these announcements revealed something that needed to be revealed. Perhaps these announcements brought to light things that needed to be brought to light. Perhaps each of these announcements, while painful and disturbing and unsettling, Perhaps each one of these can begin a process of renewal and transformation and repair. Where that which is broken can be fixed. Where a source of pain can be removed and where a barrier to full and abundant life can be overcome. It has been suggested that before the gospel of Jesus Christ can be heard as good news, it first sounds a lot like bad news. And during the season of Advent, the main bearer of this bad news is John the Baptist. <clears throat> now I apologize to you, this is the second time I've dealt with John the Baptist this Advent. I'd rather not do it, but trying to avoid John the Baptist during Advent is like trying to avoid your shadow. He just won't go away. And did you hear what he said to people who had gathered around him when he was preaching and baptizing? Did he say, oh, I'm so glad to see you. I love you and God loves you. And you seem like such nice people. I'm sure God notices that too. Nope, that's not what he said. What he said was, you brood of vipers, you bunch of snakes. What makes you think you're good enough to approach God? Be warned, God is coming and His winnowing fork is in His hand and He will gather wheat in his, to His storehouses and the chaff He will burn with an unquenchable fire. And then Luke tells us that with messages like this, John the Baptist preached good news to the people. 
Well, I don't know about you, but if someone came into here and addressed us as a bunch of snakes to tell us that we are unworthy to be in the presence of God, I'm not sure that would sound much like good news to us. How would you like to be told that you are unworthy to be in God's presence, unworthy even to be in church? That because of your chronic sinfulness, you're going to experience the stern judgment of God. Does that sound like good news to you? Well, it doesn't to me. But maybe it is. Because it's only when we come to an honest awareness of our sinfulness and our flaws and our shortcomings that we are ready to experience the promise of God's saving grace. It's only when we are confronted honestly with the bad news of our sinfulness that we can appreciate what it means to be fully and freely forgiven. Think of it this way, if I assume that I'm perfectly healthy and that I will always be perfectly healthy, I won't pay much attention to the news about significant advances in medical sciences and I probably won't go for my physical. But if I know I have a family history of heart trouble or high blood pressure or Alzheimer's disease, my ears perk up when I hear about research being done and I do try to stay in touch with my doctors. In the same way, if I live with a sense of certainty and confidence about my own righteousness, the promise of forgiveness, well, that doesn't mean that much to me because I don't think I need it. But if I am aware that I live in constant, daily, ongoing need for the grace of God, then I am finally in the right posture to receive that grace as it comes to me constantly and daily. So why do we get so excited about Christmas? Well, is it because of the exchange of gifts? Yes. Is it because it's an annual excuse to overeat? Yes. Is it because we like the music? Of course we do. Is it because all of our nostalgic memories of the holidays fill us with warmth? I think that's a lot of why we love this season. But I would submit to you that for all these other reasons, there is only one reason to love this season. And that is, unto us has been born a Savior. A Savior sent from God. A Savior who is God. Who has come among us to free us from the darkness that chokes life out of us, the selfishness that places all of our relationships at risk, and the greed and the corruption and the violence that disrupts human community. The gift of Christmas is the gift of a Savior who will show us that there is another way to live when our own way of living has brought us emptiness and isolation and pain. Now, most of the time when I'm standing up here as a preacher, I want to try to hold your attention from the beginning of the sermon to the end of the sermon. Although I'm sure from time to time your mind wanders. Truthfully, sometimes when I'm preaching, my mind wanders. I think to myself, is this guy not finished yet? Actually, back when I took my very first preaching class, the professor told us we need to have places in our sermons where if someone's mind had wandered, they can pick back up on our train of thought. He used to call these, he said we have to provide on-ramps back into our sermon so folks can rejoin the sermon after their mind has been wandering. This was one of those, by the way. (laughs) Well, to tell you the truth, today, and only today, I want your mind to wander. I want you to give some, I'm going to keep talking, but I want your mind to wander. I want you to give some thought to what it would mean in your life right now to repent as a way of getting ready for Christmas. 
to repent as a way of getting ready for the arrival of Jesus into our world. In other words, where in your own life today is there an inconsistency between who you want to be and who you are? An inconsistency between who God wants you to be and who you are. Now, I'm not going to come up with a list of things and then spell them out for you because I might miss the one that plagues you and then you'd be able to leave here thinking that you're fine. The truth is, none of us are fine. None of us are fine. We are all broken, flawed, misguided, blemished, corrupt, stained, imperfect, All of us have demons with which we wrestle. All of us have tendencies and inclinations of which we are not proud. All of us have thoughts that are not worthy of the followers of Jesus. All of us have attitudes that we embrace that keep us from being who God wants us to be in the world. These are the things, whatever they are for you and whatever they are for me, that are undermining our humanity, that are undermining our capacity to live with joy and serenity and neighborliness, the sort of life we saw in Jesus. These are the things from which Jesus came to save us. As I told the confirmation class a couple of weeks ago, the word sin in the New Testament is hamartia. Literally translated, it means missing the mark. So sin, I think, is really more about the selfish little things that we all do. Sin is about missing the mark. It's about missing the point of living. And if we miss the point of living, we'll miss out on the joy of living that God is trying to give us. Jesus came to save us from missing the point. He came to show us the point of living. He came to show us that the point of living is living in love for God, in love for neighbor, and He knew that our own ways of living are taking us in other directions, and so He came to us to save us from a life of missing the point, knowing that such a life would leave us empty. So that's where I want your minds to wander. What is it about your life that is causing you to miss the point of living? Because that's what Jesus came to set right in us. And it is in our openness to being set right that determines our readiness for Christmas. No matter what else you've done to get ready for Christmas. An openness to being set right by the Savior is what determines if you're really ready. Because despite whatever layers of nostalgia we have heaped upon it over the years, Christmas is only about one thing. It's about the arrival into our world of a Savior, a Savior who came into the world for our sakes so that we would know how life is to be lived. If we're not ready for that, if we're not honest about our need for that, then we're not yet ready. Not yet. But there's still time. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
Please remain standing as we affirm our faith using the traditional words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. On this frosty morning, you probably felt uh, very comforted by the fact you had a nice dress coat in your closet. But if you had a whole closet full of coats, John the Baptist would remind you, you have been given enough to share. But haven't we all? And indeed, we're blessed to be part of this great sharing community who's learned it's a joy to give to God our tithes and our offerings.
Dear God, we thank you for helping us discover one of the great joys of this season, the joy in giving. And what a joy it is to give in conjunction with our Christian friends here to rejoice that we can give and to perhaps be the ones who bring the good news to the ones who most need to hear that Christ the Lord is born. Amen. Now, the word repentance seems like an odd Advent word. This seems like a Lenten word, kind of dark and heavy. But John tells us that repentance is the way to prepare ourselves to meet this one who has come to seek us and to save us. Repentance is the door through which the saving one comes. And so allow that word to be a part of your Advent preparations as we welcome the one who transformed everything for us and transformed us for the world. And now may grace, mercy, and peace, the triune blessing of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you, with those you love and with God's people everywhere, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. 